Joshua Lockwood Logan the uh, Third. So, you know, it kind of sounds like the stereotype uh, director who is very commanding and fiery and so forth. It doesn't match up at all with the gentle Josh Logan I see before me. Do you have your other side? I'm not at all gentle. What are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> I only pretend to be gentle for in front of interviewers. <laughs> really, the, of course, a director's purpose is to stimulate, to guide, direct uh, actors. To I mean, encourage, I think, uh, more than anything else, kind of reassure. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best job he can do. Do you think that uh, a lot of this deals then with the psychology of uh, learning about people, uh, learning about these actors individually and so forth? No, somewhat. I, I think, uh, you know, it, it does help to have n know something about them individually, but we're all in a, in a joint project and we know each other very quickly, very quickly. And we know whether we like each other or not or whether we are working on the same idea or not. And uh, it, it generally works out pretty well. I know that you've worked with uh, name actors since your Princeton dropout days. <laughs> and where you, from when she went to, uh, to I don't, work do with... You think, I think that was a drop up, don't you? <laughs> right, that's more, more precise, to work with Stanislavski, of <laughs> yes, course. Yes, that's right. I think, uh, as my stepfather said, why do you want to stay in Princeton you can go, if you can go to Russia and work with Stanislavski? I, I think that's the best thing that could ever happen to you. My mother wanted me to have a degree, but I never went back and... Oh, they finally gave me one, free. <laughs> what do you think of the method? Well, I think the method is a marvelous uh, way of uh, breaking down the sort of uh, typical uh, uh, singing teacher, diction teacher uh, 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 heaviness of, of acting. But, it, it, but as Stanislavski said, it is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. It's just a way of breaking down psychologically uh, these sort of uh, sticky things that people learn about acting. And uh, I think that the method today is not what Stanislavski would approve of because uh, he, he was a much more thorough man than that. He, he, he was out for full theater experience. He, he, he was interested in diction, speaking up so you can be heard and putting the, uh, putting the author's story across. He wasn't interested in just the uh, sort of uh, narcissism of the actor, which sometimes comes, comes across as, the, as a method today. <clears throat> a successful director, of course, deals with life on very interesting terms. Uh, outside of the fact that you have been a most successful director, writer, producer, maybe not quite so successful an actor, but an actor in the beginning. Uh, well, I tell you what, I, I was an actor until I had too many complaints. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel your most accomplishment, uh, greatest accomplishment as a man has been? Well, I think... Uh, I don't know, I never thought of it that way. I just think that just keep going, keeping going, I think is the greatest accomplishment. The fact that I, I'm still at it, I think is, is something fabulous, don't you? I, think I mean, so. I started an awful long time ago, and I, I still uh, am working in the thing I love best, and uh, I, I seem to, I've just had the best job I think I ever had in my life, and enjoyed doing it, and I think that's quite an accomplishment to, uh, just in itself. I heard you a few moments ago say that uh, television is probably the greatest media ever invented by man, and yet I know you have serious reservations about what uh, has been done with the media. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yes, I just don't think that uh, many people take advantage of television. I, I, I'll admit that there are exceptions, but there's such a vast amount of it that is so stereotyped and so shoddy and so badly done and such, uh, so tastelessly done. And I think that the, uh, I think greatly it's because of, I think that, that sponsors are not artists, and they, they rule a great deal of, of, of television today. And, and to me, there, there, there can be, uh, stories could be told, for instance, uh, by, uh, by a man who follows an actor through the streets and let, let, let the story develop by a kind of a spontaneous story. Something like that could happen on television. It could never happen anywhere else in, in, in any other form. You know, I would be interested. So many times motion pictures uh, come out, which are motion pictures of Broadway performances, and you find that the people who have been successful on Broadway aren't put in the motion pictures because they aren't experienced motion picture people. Now, they're Camelot... Not, they're not photogenic. That's the reason. Well, you can hardly say that about Camelot, though, as had Julie Andrews, Richard Burton, and Robert Goulet. But isn't uh, it possible that they may have been miscast in the original picture, and in, in the play? For instance, I felt that Julie Andrews, lovely as she is, and I'm her devoted fan, I thought she was absolutely wrong for Guinevere. I think that's a, that was the last person that should have played Guinevere. Vanessa Redgrave is the best person to have played Guinevere, and fortunately, we were able to get her. Uh, I think Julie Andrews was 
the perfect person for the sound of music. And I think she probably should have played uh, the other one that we won't mention. But uh, <laughs> I think Vanessa Redgrave should have played Guinevere. She was made by God for Guinevere. So was uh, Richard Harris. Nobody knew he could sing. He sings much better than Richard Burton, although he's no, no better actor, but he's a little bit better for Arthur, I think, in the motion picture than, uh, than uh, Richard Burton. And I, I also think Richard Burton and, and Virginia Woolf was, uh, well, unsurpassable. We're going but to wind but up he, was one, he was wonderful as Arthur, I must say. I don't want, want to run him down at all. Except we have, I think, a better cast all the way around than they had on the stage. And it makes it a much better picture than it was a stage play. We're talking a bit about the uh, control of sponsors and having the right of censorship in certain areas. Don't you have backers who have the same right? Oh, yes. Well, not backers don't have any... Uh, no, they have no right. All they have a right to do is put their money up. That's all. Uh, we're talking about people being photogenic and so forth. Are there other differences in acting ability that come, uh, that become important in talking about the two different media? It's very hard to discuss that because the camera sort of eats up certain people and rejects others, and I don't know what that is. It's a something that's a mystery. It's, it's uh, Vanessa Redgrave's more beautiful on, 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 on the screen than she is in real life. Frank Nero who plays uh, Lancelot, is one of the handsomest men in the world on the screen, and he looks like an Italian barber who was very seedy at the, you know, <laughs> to begin with, off, off screen. You have the advantage in this motion picture, too, of the wide expanse of the screen, which, uh, of course, in the stage presentation, they didn't. Well, they, you know, they had to talk about the joust, and they had to talk about uh, the, the battles and saving Guinevere from the stake. We can show it. Mm -hmm. I understand you use a lot of castles. Well, uh, certainly Camelot is supposed to be set in the British area, but you didn't find castles there? You went to Spain? Is that well, the reason is that Spain, uh, uh, the castles in Spain have been saved by the dry climate and uh, by what John Drus Ruskin called the beneficent goddess of poverty. <laughs> and uh, the English castles have been uh, so rained on for so many years that they've they crumbled a bit. And there are also television aerials about and houses of the 19th century in front of them and things like that. Whereas in Spain, they, they grow out of this vast uh, expanse of nothing. And they're very dramatic. And they are of the period. There are 5,000 castles in Spain. That's why the expression castles in Spain has a real meaning. <laughs> you know, before we move on to what might be coming up next for Josh Logan, we must mention that Camelot, of course, will be opening in the Twin City area at the Academy Theater November 8th. Now, we have that point made. <laughs> What's next? It's also in 70 millimeter, which is, I just uh, heard about it, is the most beautiful sound. I just heard, uh, finished it last week. And uh, that you must see in a big theater. To mm -hmm. Don't wait to see it in a small theater. I, I, I <laughs> warn, I want to warn everybody. It's better in the big wide screen. It really is. I'm, and that's not a plug for the picture. It's just a plug for my work. <laughs> <laughs> What's coming up next for Josh Logan? I'm going to do uh, Paint Your Wagon, another Learner Low musical. It's, a, it's late in the California gold rush in the 49 and 50. And uh, it was done on Broadway about 10 years ago, and then through a series of accidents was never made into a movie, and thank goodness, because they waited for me. Any writing? Uh, writing? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm working on another script, uh, uh, a, a dramatization of a play, of a book I bought called Careful He Might Hear You, uh, an Australian story, a, a smaller uh, scale story. And I'm, I'm, right, I'm working on that on weekends with my wife. <laughs> Is there any possibility that we might be able to lure Joshua Logan over to the television industry to help solve some of those problems we were talking about a while ago? As long as I don't ever have to ask any sponsor's wife how to do it, you know, <laughs> what I'm allowed to do. Yes, I'd love to do a television show if I could just find the right uh, uh, one. And I don't want to do a series. I'd like to do something that uh, is, uh, is of the minute and, uh, and, and takes advantage of the medium. And I'd like to have a lot of freedom. <laughs> we were talking a little while ago about a twin city uh, of whom you thought a great deal, a man uh, we're very proud of, Thomas Hagen in this area. You knew him very well, didn't you? Yes, he was uh, probably as close a friend as I ever had in my life. And as you uh, know, I named my son, Ned, and I named my, our son, uh, Thomas Hagen Logan. He's now 17 years old and is very proud of his uh, name. And I'm here to see uh, Mr. Hagen and uh, Tom's sisters because we're very close friends. And I guess we loved Tom uh, and respected him as much as any person we'd ever known in our lives, Ned and I. And I think, I, I think the, that when he died in that terrible accident, he, uh, uh, that we lost one of the greatest uh, 
talent that the uh, English language could ever have had. I think in the, in the, in the years that, that he has not been with us, he would have become one of the major figures in, in world literature. He was a true genius. Mr. Logan, thank you very much for spending this time with us this evening. We want to remind you once again, Camelot, the brand new effort of the director, Joshua Logan. Thanks once again. Thank you.